So I am not a neuroscientist, but I have been really inspired by the work in neuroscience. And I have been working for the last several years to get some of the most important ideas out to teachers. Um, as we probably know, teachers don't have time and usually access to read research articles. Um, so we sh share a lot of this uh, information on YouCubed. Jason's really important work is on there um, as our other neuroscientists. And what's been great is we have translated some of these ideas into lessons for teachers and videos for learners. And um, yeah, we've been very happy with the uptake. So the first idea that we share with teachers, this may seem obvious to a lot of people listening, but is the neuroplasticity that Jason has been talking about. Um, unfortunately, many people have the opposite view that you're either born with a math brain or you're not. Students believe that idea, teachers believe it. Schooling structures have really been developed around those fixed ideas. So this is not how it works, although this is what many people believe. And students, when they start to struggle in a maths classroom, often start to think, mm, I don't have the right kind of brain. That student over there has the maths brain and I don't. So we encourage uh, teachers to share with their students what neuroscientists have shared with me, which is that every time we learn, these connections are happening in our brain. We could be forming a new brain pathway. We could be connecting brain pathways or strengthening pathways. And these pathways are developing all the time. This is the essence of neuroplasticity. Um, some of the very first work that was done that discovered the plasticity of the brain was actually in my hometown of London, where they decided um, to focus on London black cab drivers. Turns out to become a black cab driver, you have to, uh, you have to know 25,000 streets and 20,000 landmarks in central London and all the connections between them. So after going through this intense spatial training, neuroscientists studied the brains of the cab drivers and found that at the end of this training period, their hippocampus had developed and grown. Also that when they retired from being cab drivers, that area of the brain shrunk back down not because they were getting older, but just because they weren't using that area of the brain as much. I also like to share the stories of people. This is somebody called Nicholas Letchford, who grew up in Australia. And in first grade, his parents were told he was learning disabled. He had a very low IQ. The parents were told he was the worst child they'd seen in the school for 20 years. Terrible messages. But his mother decided to uh, really take on um, these labels. I'm pleased to tell you that Nicholas graduated from Oxford with a doctorate in applied mathematics a couple of years ago. You can't really get higher achievement than that. So we know now that with the right messages, with the right um, educational work, that all students, even those with special educational needs, can change their brains. Um, so that's the first evidence I really emphasize with teachers. The other that I think is really important is just the importance of the times for our brain when we're struggling, when we're making mistakes, these turn out to be really good times for the brain. There's some of the first evidence of this came from Jason Moser and his colleagues who found that when they were studying people's brains that they there was actually synapses were firing, activity was happening when people were making mistakes. And um, you know, neuroscientists have shared with me that if you're not struggling, you're not learning. It's really critical that you engage your brain in that kind of struggle. We find when we share this message with learners, it's freeing. It will cause them to keep going for longer, to persist. When I teach maths and people look at me and say, oh, this is so hard, I say to them, that's fantastic. That feeling of it being so hard, it feels like that because your brain is working so hard. And this, this message of embracing struggle is one that changes not just learners, but adults. They're more willing to, to share times of uncertainty. Um, we do, as well as work with teachers, uh, every so often we have summer camps at Stanford where we bring in students. Um, one of our camps a couple of years ago, we brought in middle school students. And after four weeks of sharing these messages and teaching maths differently, they improved 
um, at the same, at a rate that was equivalent to 2.8 years of school. So it was pretty phenomenal. And when I was learning about this research on struggle, I really thought back to this particular student, uh, Isabella, who um, was the student who really seemed to be struggling the most, who was often willing to share her thinking even when it was wrong, and um, was what the what um, people talk about being right at the edge of her understanding. So I looked back at our data and found that she actually improved more than any student in the whole camp. And she was, as I said, at this place of being at the edge of her understanding, which we know is a really important place to be. So that message of struggle is extremely important one. I'm very fortunate to work with great teachers who have taken on these messages. And I wanted to share with you, this is one of them, uh, Jen Schaefer is a fifth grade teacher in Canada. And she shares these messages in different ways. She has this image on post-it notes or through her room. And she says to the kids, you've got to get on the steps of struggle. You don't need to be that cocky kid on the top step, but you don't want to be the one on the bottom step. These steps are really important. And she said the kids really like this metaphor. There's one they like even more. It's called the learning pit or getting into that pit of struggle. This is an image that her fifth grade students made together. And you can see as they're going down into the pit, they're saying things like, I'm not good at math, so I'm confused. But as they're coming out, they're saying, you know, I'm just going to get some tools and work harder. And I loved that when I interviewed Jen, she said that her students come to her and they say, Miss Schaefer, I'm really in the pit. And her response to that is excellent. What classroom tools do you need? And there's a couple of important things about that response. One, she values them being in the pit. The other, she doesn't jump in and make the work easier for them. She asks them what tools will help them. And I think as teachers, we have all been trained to save students from struggle, to make the work more structured, to empty it of that struggle. And that's something we should rethink. And then another uh, area of neuroscience that is amazing uh, comes from a neuroscient another neuroscientist at Stanford, Vinod Meenan and his group have shown that when we think about something mathematical, there's actually five different brain pathways that are activated. And it's really important, not only that we activate these different pathways, but that we connect pathways. And we know in mathematics, there are lots of ways to think mathematically. And when we think, for example, with numbers, but also with words, with pictures, with graphs or algorithms or tables, when we build things or move with mathematics, that's going to enable these great brain connections that are so important. Um, a lot of this neuroscience leads into the amazing work of Carol Dweck and her knowledge that, you know, what you believe about yourself actually will change um, what you can do. If you believe that struggle is good and that you, your brain is growing, that will actually change your learning. We have evidence that's extensive on what happens when you change your mindset, improving learning, decreasing aggression. But um, I have found over the last year since mindset ideas have been released that a lot of teachers have jumped on this mindset bus or bandwagon. They're sharing ideas that, you know, you've just got to work hard. But when those ideas hit the wall of what I think of as fixed mathematics, those ideas fall flat. And what I mean by fixed mathematics is questions with one answer, with one method, where kids don't see how they can grow and learn. So at Ucubed, we do a lot of work to change mathematics to be one that has space inside it for learning, where there are opportunities for brain connections by seeing maths visually. And so I wanted to show you a couple of examples of this. Um, and my first example comes from fractions. This is like the bane of many kids' lives, the vision of fractions, teachers as well. So you can ask this question in a totally fixed way. What is one divided by two thirds? Kids get stressed, they try and do a calculation. Or great teachers like uh, Kathy Humphreys starts with, you may know a rule for this, but I don't care about the rule today. I want you to make sense of this answer visually and prove it to me with visuals. So here, suddenly this question changes dramatically from one that's a calculation 
to one that has these opportunities for growth, for brain connections. Um, let's think about another one, rectangles. We can really change all maths questions. Uh, you can ask kids, what's the, what's the area of an eight by three rectangle? And their task is to calculate, it has one answer, probably one method. Or you can ask kids, what rectangles have an area of 24? Think about that. Now they're having to think about the relationship between length and width. There are lots of different answers to think about. They can visualize. So we can really do this with all mathematics. If I were to ask you now, which I will ask you, to think about the answer to 18 times five number problem, to think about that in your head um, without writing anything down. I'm not gonna, I'm sorry, give you time to really think about this, but I will share that when I asked lots of people this question, the first um, method that many people use is to in their head, think of that traditional algorithm, line it up, carry the numbers, actually not the easiest thing to think about when you're doing it mentally which is fine, this is one method, but we can also uh, think about 18 times five in different ways. People with number flexibility are able to think about 20 times five and take off two fives or maybe 10 times five and eight times five or nine times fives or 18s or one of my favorites, 18 times five is actually the same as nine times 10. And that visual really shows why that is the case. So um, you may be thinking to yourself, OK, we can open up these maths problems. What about things like algebra has to be really procedural? So one of my favorite problems that I like to share is to ask people. So this is a pattern that's often used in maths class. And kids are asked, how many squares are in the nth case? And the expectation in maths class is that kids will count the squares and stare at this table of numbers until they notice that there's a relationship between the case number and the total number of squares. And that relationship is that you add one and square to get the total number. We have just changed this question slightly by asking kids, how do you see the growth? And, um, and what happens is students will see how this shape grows in all sorts of different ways. Not only do they see it in different ways, but that visual growth allows them to understand the function that describes this algebraically. It does grow as an n plus one squared function. And we see, if you look at that method on the bottom right hand, right hand corner, exactly why it's a square function. So I think we've done a great disservice in mathematics by making it all about numbers without visuals, without opening up problems. And uh, one other area of neuroscience that's just so incredible um, comes also from the labs at Stanford and, and other places, finding out that fingers are so important to mathematics. When you increase your finger perception, your maths achievement goes up, which is really amazing. Um, this has led, Jason talked about the value of interdisciplinary projects uh, to a study that we've been involved in in the last year or so, educators, engineers, neuroscientists, actually making small robotic devices where kids interact with mathematics through their fingers, feeling their finger um, reaction, really amazing results. So um, I, before I leave you, I just wanted to share that when teachers take on these messages from neuroscience, when they make mathematics more multidimensional, when they're sharing the value of struggle and the value, you know, the fact that our brains are changing all the time, amazing things happen. One middle school teacher attended one of our workshops, went back and changed the way he was teaching maths. And inside that year, his eighth grade class, uh, which he was getting 6% proficiency rates, went up to 70%. So we know this is highly effective. We've studied it as well with hundreds of teachers. Um, this study on the right was one we did in the Central Valley where teachers took my online class and went and changed their teaching. And even inside that year, we got significant increases um, from students on standardized tests. So um, if you would like to read more or find out more about this, these are some books that share these ideas. Here are some online classes that share these ideas. The 
one on the left is the one that the teachers took in the Central Valley. And um, do, I do encourage you to come to UCubed. You'll be hearing about data initiatives in a little while. One of our recent initiatives is to share data lessons K-12 and a new high school course. So thank you for listening.